Good morning. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Created. And thank you for coming along to the second of our two sessions that are focusing on art and design in the primary classroom. I'm Charlotte. I'm Charlotte Dack, and I'm one of the area managers from Culture Bridge Northeast. And for those of you who don't know much about us, we are Art Council England's bridge organisation for the Northeast. And our mission is to connect the cultural sector and the education sector together so that children and young people have access to a really rich cultural education. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce and hand over to our, our speakers for today, our facilitators. So our industry specialist today is artist and illustrator, Rachel Thompson. Hi, Rachel. Hiya. Hi. So Rachel's going to be leading our session today. And she's focusing on drawing and mark making techniques in response to the written word. So drawing and poetry together, which is really exciting. And um, we're also supported today by Jean Hale, our class our well, creative classroom producer. Hi, Jean. And Jean's an independent consultant. She works in schools and within the cultural sector too. Hello. Morning, everyone. Morning. So I think I'll hand over now to Rachel, if that's okay. And I hope everybody has a really good morning. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you all. And it's great to see so many faces today. And from in a different part of the country to where I am mostly, I'm in based in Cambridge. So it's actually lovely to see and meet some teachers from, a bit further. I think as far as I understand, um, Northern England mostly. So that's, um, that's great. It's really interesting. But as Charlotte said, I'm Rachel. I'm an artist and an illustrator. I actually trained originally in theatre set design and that was really where I sort of formed quite a fascination really with um, connecting text with visual arts and the relationship that those two concepts can have, those two disciplines. And so my work has sort of evolved into that kind of direction. I sort of have another hat as well in that I work for a, an organisation called Access Art and I work a lot with, with teachers, primary school teachers mostly, and um, we support um, visual arts curriculum within schools. That's my other hat. So I'm sort of quite used to meeting teachers from all over the place and to um, hearing your experiences. So while I'm not in the classroom myself every day, I, I hope at least that I have a sort of an understanding of the sort of conditions of, of schools and also some of the, the challenges that can be faced, particularly with the visual arts, which I'm aware can be a subject that um, it can be hard to protect sometimes. So we'll make a little start. We're going to, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do, and then we're going to do a couple of warm ups. So I'll talk a bit more about the warm ups in a minute. But this is obviously a, a session about drawing and poetry or drawing to poetry. And it's an area that really interests me. I mean, it's interested in exploring how it can, drawing to poetry can make poetry or the response to literature a little bit more accessible. Um, enable children particularly to connect with words and the, the images that are associated with words and in particular when thinking about poetry how you know, the words that are used are weighted with meaning they're quite carefully selected words and phrases more so than perhaps in prose so it's it's a lovely way to sort of to kind of pick apart text and to hopefully make it a little bit more accessible. So just some thoughts on the activities we're doing today. They're really about encouraging a slowing down, not just in terms of actual drawing, but also in, in reading and comprehension. I will be reading out some poems today, but in if you were in the classroom, obviously it may be that you might have the, the text up on your whiteboard as well as reading it out. So there's an element of reading as well as comprehension happening. It's a it's a chance really to for you as well to to process things at varying speeds. So some some of the activities are a little bit faster, some are a bit slower, and allowing sort of keeping the learning, uh, being aware that there's different ways in which children learn and different speeds. So sort of trying to meet those needs of the children and 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 your needs as well. The activities obviously squeeze into this session today slightly, but, um, but in reality, all of them could be slowed down quite a lot and you could have a chance to really discover them with your class over a longer period of time. Um, also, they can be repeated and in fact, particularly with the warm ups, but also the other activities as well, that kind of repeated practice is, is quite important. I would advocate that as an important part of any creative curriculum within school that um, and, and really enables children to begin creative journeys and creative confidence. So sort of slow repeated practice of some of the drawing is, is a really positive thing to, to sort of embed into the school week. There's no right or wrong way to respond 
through your drawing today. It's it's an opportunity to explore and to experience, and there's no pressure on any kind of final outcome, and that nothing is predefined. So I'm saying that to you as, as adults, but also I would say that applies to looking this with children as well. I think children do find it quite challenging to to relinquish a sort of control over a piece of artwork that they might be doing, and it actually takes practice to to let go of that control and for them to, to sort of understand and appreciate that what they're producing isn't necessarily about being complete or perfect. And the way really that that happens is just through, like I said a minute ago, the repeated practice, the exposure to doing an art lesson that is absolutely got exploration at its, at its centre. And it's great to see some art leaf and also some um, English leaves here as well, because these activities are very much, you know, can be part of a literacy cur curriculum as well as an art curriculum. And it's, I think it provides a nice scope really for collaboration between departments, between colleagues. Um, and, you know, so I think that's quite a, what's, what's quite nice about this really. So I'm just going to check in with your with material. So hopefully you've got some bits and pieces around you, some paper, um, something to draw with it's quite fluid you know I mean it doesn't matter if you don't have everything I, I'm not quite sure what the what um you've been sent around as a materials list but hopefully you've got some paper a pencil which is on the softer end of the scale preferably but don't worry if not hopefully some charcoal as well and for this little next bit you're going to need your pencil and your charcoal so if you'd like to just take a moment to get to your things in front of you and get comfortable. I've got A3 paper here, but it doesn't matter if you don't have A3 paper. So I'll just give you a minute to get your check in with what you have around you. We're going to start with pencils. So if you want to get your pencils, I've got a 3B pencil here, which is a lovely soft, soft pencil and works quite well for this. So when you're ready, what I'd like you to do is hold your pencil right at the very tip and hover it over your paper so you're just holding the very very end of the pencil and you're quite lightly as well and then when you're ready just start drawing your pencil over the paper sort of dragging it sweeping it begin to make a bit of a journey with it now i'm pressing really quite lightly at the moment so it might be a bit tricky to see the lines but we'll, we'll be going in a bit harder in a minute. But for now, it's, we're, it's gentle and we want to try and hold the pencil as vertically as we can. It's quite difficult to see on the vertical on this visualizer. But... So we're just making a journey across the page. We're allowing it to travel freely all over. Think about the lines you're making. Just be in the moment with those lines. Don't, don't think too much about which direction you're going. Just allow the pencil to move. You're taking that pencil on a journey over the paper into this space. Now, when you're ready, you're going to change slightly. This time, I'm going to hold the pencil like this. So I'm holding it further down. And I'm gripping it harder now. And we're going to make some different lines. Oh, I've just broken my lead. <laughs> just going to grab another pencil. I've got a 5B here now, so it's a little bit softer. Okay, so we're making some harder lines here. Now that you'll also see that they're a little bit thicker because you're pressing down harder. So we're applying more pressure. But we're still just making that journey across the paper. We're not thinking where we're going. We're not thinking about drawing anything in particular. We're just making some movement. You might want to vary the, the, the shapes that you're making. You might want to keep it quite small in the center so that your actual arm is not moving that much. But then you might want to really move your, really push your shoulder from your shoulder out. Okay. Next, what we're going to do, I'm going to flatten the pencil down a bit so that you can see the actual, um, the graphite there is flat uh, um, on the paper. So you get basically a bigger surface area is pressing down onto that paper and applying quite a lot of pressure now. So I'm doing this so you can see it, but what I would do normally is actually, I'm, I'm covering it now, but I would press my finger here down onto that flattened bit of graphite so that you're really applying that pressure. 
And we're going to vary the marks a little bit now. So we've been doing some sweeping gestures and now we're going to do some shorter lines and maybe increase the speed slightly and see what those lines start looking like together. What's the relationship between them? And see what happens when you apply pressure and then release that pressure. So, and but keeping it in the same lines, you can see on, we get the darker tones and then we get the lighter tones that follow it. And you get this lovely line of different marks. Okay, so just take a look for a moment at what you've done and what the lines look like to you. Just, just, just take a moment really to look at it, to observe it, thinking about how the lines cross over. Do you, does anything jump out at you? Can you understand anything within the shapes? Does it, does it spark any ideas? Have you accidentally created a picture of something? Does it remind you of something? Okay, and when you're ready, if you have some charcoal I've got a piece of charcoal here when you're doing this if you're doing this in your classes I would recommend just breaking up the sticks of charcoal so I think they normally and um, the ones I have anyway come in a, a stick that's probably about 15 centimeters long and they don't all need one that long so you can certainly conserve the material by breaking it into three it also means that they, it doesn't break quite as much when they're using it which is quite fun but also just being mindful of resources which I know sometimes need to be conserved. So what I always say with charcoal is it's just such a lovely material to just hold in your hand for a moment and just to feel it. And because it's, you know, pencils are used a lot, but charcoal is used slightly less. So it's just a lovely material. So I'd like you to just invite you to just hold it in your hand to experience what it feels like. Thinking about the process of how charcoal is made, that intense heat that's applied to willow normally it is, but there's different types of charcoal. And what a fascinating thing that is that um, through that process, a drawing material can be created. But it's nice to connect with the materials to discover them, for the children to have that time to discover them as well. Okay, so we're going to use our charcoal now. I'd like you to hold it on its side, okay? And we're going to drag it over. And we're just gonna do, I'm gonna do one big sweep all the way across to start with. And I'm gonna cross it over, see where it takes me. So we're joining the charcoal lines in, in amongst with our pencil lines. And just have a look at the effect it creates. We're seeing them side by side. We're seeing them overlapping. And we're going to release the pressure slightly, start doing some softer lines. And already you can just see that the connection between the two different materials is just lovely. And building up layering is really, it's just a lovely way to explore materials. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to circle and spiral. So maybe in the middle of your page, you want to start that. I'm just going to circle, 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 spiral. This is why having A3 paper is quite good. So if at all possible, I would recommend doing this on larger sheets. I mean, obviously, you can do it even larger. It's a great thing to do up on the wall. Um, it's a great thing to do on the floor. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to invite you to just dot. We're going to dot and dash. Don't be afraid of it. Just let it find some spaces that are not covered with any material yet, but also integrate those dots and dashes in with the existing marks that you've made. So you'll see that doing this creates some dust and some little bits that chip off. So that's a good moment to just put down your charcoal and, and use your finger and just experience what that's like, what happens if. It's always a good question to ask me, what happens if I smudge this bit here? So just use your fingers to just explore the page, to feel that dust. And you'll see it sort of creates a little bit of a, a kind of gray blanket kind of background. Now I would, I would encourage, you know, I'm not, I'm not smudging the whole of my mark making here, I've chosen a small area and I'm just doing it in this area because it's still nice to see that contrast. So now I can, I notice that I've got this gray blanket background, but then I've got the sort of the arches of the spot in the most part of the spiral coming out of the smudge. And I think that looks quite interesting. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's not an object, but it's an interesting um, connection of marks. Okay, now another thing you can do at this point is to get an eraser. I've just got a rubber eraser here. So if anyone, if you have got one to hand, don't worry if you don't. But um, this is a nice 
opportunity to just work into the marks of the eraser and see what happens. Can you bring it right back to the paper? Normally not, but sometimes you can. I find that I'm using newsprint here actually, which is a very thin kind of paper, which is great for charcoal. But actually if you're using cartridge paper with charcoal, it's slightly easier to bring it back because you've got you've already got the slight gray tone of the newsprint. So you can work into it. And you know, if you're doing this with your class, just let them have a play, it's just about exploring. Another thing that you can do is take, um, I've got a dry paintbrush here and you can just work a dry paintbrush in as well. Some brushes are soft and some are more bristly and you could have a, a range available so that the children are able to make choices and explore both and what do they prefer. So when you're ready, we'll just leave that one there. That's just a, an exploration of um, mark making and paper. So I'd invite you to just, if you can, just flip over your bit of paper so that you have a, a clean space. And we're going to do another quick warm up. Okay, what I've got is a series of words which I'm going to read out and I'm going to probably leave about eight seconds in between each one and um, what I want you to do is just using what you can choose your charcoal or your pencil whichever you prefer just to respond to those words in whichever way that you feel comes to you instinctively. It's not about producing a complete picture with identifiable objects or landscapes, people or whatever, but it's an instinctive and perhaps an abstract, a more abstract response to, the, to that word in the form of lines, textures, shapes and marks, just like we've just done now. Okay, so when you're ready, I'm just going to, I'm going to go through them and, and you, know, you just follow your instinct. Okay, wandering. Fragile. Alert. Ominous. Crowded. Reflective. And finally, impending. So obviously if you were, you can, you can adapt and change these words according to the age group that you're working with. Obviously some of the little teenies won't necessarily understand all of those words and won't have the vocabulary for it. So by all means, they can be up, you know, replaced with more age appropriate words. But some of them, you know, should be fine. And I think, um, obviously I've only given you a few seconds there and do carry on drawing as I'm talking obviously but in reality you know what, what's lovely is you can extend that so you could you could spend 15 minutes talking about what what feelings that word evokes and if you've then done the sort of warm-up and the exploration of the materials prior to that then they can then apply that warm-up to then this this exploration of the words so you're sort of making that connection between the material um, and then the more conceptual thinking about the vocabulary and the words and the understanding of the text. So there's some quite good words there. And, um, you know, they can be small little responses, but they can also be on a larger scale as well. And they're just really about, you know, experimenting with and discovering materials and responding to words instinctively. So trying to connect with an instinctive creative response. Okay. And so when you're ready, you'll need a little bit more paper. Hopefully we've got a few other sheets to hand. We're going to move on and look at a poem now, a full poem. And we're going to focus more on imagery and we're going to bring in some colour. So if you have got some colour materials, that would be wonderful. It can be just pencils, pastels. If you've got watercolour paint, that's also absolutely fine. Whatever you feel 
you want to use or whatever you have available. And I'm going to read through a poem. And what I'd like you to do as I read it is to make a note, just writing, and make a note of any particular words or images that sort of jump out at you or speak to you in some way. And just like with the, the response just there in the warm up, just be instinctive and, and uninhibited and just, just whatever sort of you feel you connect with as I'm reading it. And just to say that these words are just for you, we're not, I'm not gonna ask you to share them. This is your individual response. So I'm going to read a poem called As If to Demonstrate an Eclipse by an American poet called Biddy Collins, who I'm sure some of you have heard of. So as I'm, as I'm reading, do feel free to just listen and then to, to use your paper and your pencil to just write down what speaks to you. I pick an orange from a wicker basket and place it on the table to represent the sun. And down at the other end, the blue and white marble becomes the earth. And nearby, I lay the little moon of an aspirin. I get a glass from a cabinet, open a bottle of wine, and I sit in a ladder back chair, a benevolent God presiding over a miniature creation myth. Then I begin to sing a homemade canticle of thanks for this perfect little arrangement. For not making the earth too hot or cold, not making it spin too fast or slow, so that the grove of orange trees in the hour become possible, not to mention the rolling wave, the play of clouds, geese in flight, and the zed of lightning on a dark lake. Then I fill my glass again and give thanks for the trout, the oak, and the yellow feather, singing the room full of shadows, as sun and earth and moon circle one another in their impeccable orbits. And I get more and more cockeyed with gratitude. So hopefully if there's some words of that have jumped out at you, I'll read it through again in a moment. But just take a moment to look at the words you've written down and just analyze you know, to yourself, you know, are they specific objects? Was it objects that, that jumped out at you or are they more fluid images or patterns or even feelings? That you've responded to. Think about the colour associated with your chosen words. So you know, the rolling wave is that blue, or the Z of lightning, the yellow feather, obviously, and the orange itself. So what I'd like you to do is just choose one image or word from the list that you've made, just one that you feel you connect to the most or one of the most, and that you'd like to focus on for the next drawing activity. So trying to adopt some of the methods that we use in the warm up, I'd like you to just begin to sketch out your response to that word or that image on your piece of paper using the, the materials of your choice. So you may want to start with pencil or charcoal, um, thinking about the layering again, you know, when are you going to bring in the colour? How does the colour work within your response? So you can, there's, you know, like I said earlier, there's no right or wrong way to respond here. And, and you might you might just gravitate towards rendering something that's a sort of naturalistic representation. Like there's a yellow feather mentioned and uh, we can all kind of imagine a yellow feather. But it's also equally valid to make some marks or do some drawing that um, demonstrates the feeling of that image. So lightning, for example, we can kind of imagine the shape that lightning might be. And you might bring in some yellows, yellow pastel for that or yellow colour. But lightning might not be that to you. It might be that it's a series of sharp dots or dashes or swirls across the paper that do more in terms of communicating what lightning is or the, the feelings that lightning might evoke, the speed of it, the, the, the sort of the way that it's quite dramatic. And just think about how you can um, respond to that with your marks. So just work instinctively, and as you do that, I'm going to um, read the poem once more. I pick an orange from a wicker basket and place it on the table to represent the sun. Then down at the other end, the blue and white marble becomes the earth. And nearby, I lay the little moon with an aspirin. I get a glass from a cabinet, open a bottle of wine, then I sit in a ladder back, ladder back chair, a benevolent God presiding over a miniature creation myth. And I begin to sing a homemade canticle of thanks for this perfect little arrangement, for not making the earth 
too hot or cold, not making it spin too fast or slow, so that the grove of orange trees and the owl become possible, not to mention the rolling wave, the play of clouds, geese in flight, and the zed of lightning on a dark lake. Then I fill my glass again and give thanks for the trout, the oak, and the yellow feather, singing the room full of shadows as sun and earth and moon circle one another in their impeccable orbits. And I get more and more cockeyed with gratitude. So I'll just let you carry on for a moment to finish. And the reason when I mentioned about the different approaches, how you can approach this activity, the more literal with the more abstract, I think it's important to, um, to just be aware of that for children as well, because obviously very young children might find engaging with more abstract interpretations of images more challenging. And they might, you know, they just have more literal brains, but it, it doesn't mean to say that you can't begin to, to introduce the idea of imagery and feeling that a poem can evoke. So yes, they might they might home in on that yellow feather, but you that can sort of kickstart that conversation of what kind of quality does a feather have? If you threw a feather up into the air on a windy day, what might happen? What might happen if a feather got wet? Would it get heavier? How would you draw that? So just sort of allowing the children to inquire and to discover. And that's all, you know, through those the class discussions and, and for them to, to converse between amongst themselves. It's worth saying that you could, there's recordings of poems available online as well. So you can you can actually, I think in fact, I'm sure there's one of Billy Collins himself reading this somewhere and um, that you could play. And um, it's always really interesting hearing and also read their own work. I think um, it sort of it gives another just another layer to the meaning sometimes. So just a little idea there that you could do. So thinking about your colour that you're using and whether you're you know how do you sort of create um, a tonal value with that colour? You know, thinking about how we use the when we were gripping the pencils and the charcoal earlier, releasing that pressure to create soft lines and dark lines, um, and trying to um, engage with that as well with the colour. Obviously pastels and, and coloured pencils being dry materials have quite a different effect to watercolours and I, like sort of more poster paint that um, I know is used a lot in schools. But, I mean watercolour is, is, is a wonderful paint for children to, to get familiar with so I would definitely recommend trying to bring some watercolour in if you're delivering this session. It's a great one to do for a warm-up as well. So I'll just give you just another moment to just finish off. If you want to, you've selected, obviously you've wrote down your words that you responded to and then chose one if you want to sort of write whichever it was that you chose next to your drawing, then it just creates that connection between that word and that image and just gets us into that space where we're really exploring what that word means to us and crucially that that response is individual to us as well and it's not something that is anybody else's. Rachel, could I just ask a question? Yeah, sure. When when we started writing the words down, would you would you anticipate that the children actually used that same paper to, to draw them, to make the yeah. marks on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think really it, this is about just using it, enjoying the paper and and really not being precious about where what's where basically all of these activities can be they're great for sketchbook particularly the warm-ups are great for sketchbook activity and so if you have sketchbooks in your school this these types of warm-ups are great for, for putting in there um, and then if you're doing larger scale drawings and that can they can become self-contained but they can be stuck into a sketchbook as well so oh yeah I would absolutely you know I, I'm a big fan of sort of drawings on drawings and drawings within multiple drawings within one page and and really getting them to practice the idea of it doesn't matter if you've got a bit of a crowded space on that page it's not one tiny drawing on one page and, but I, you know I know they do it my daughter does that all the time <laughs> sort of perfect picture in the middle turn the page another perfect picture in the middle of the page and you know it's it's fascinating but um it's just about trying to gently introduce other ways of drawing, but it is challenging. Lovely. So when you're, you want to just sort of gently finish off the marks that you're making, but don't, don't feel you have to come to an abrupt halt. If anybody would like to 
share what they've drawn. That's absolutely wonderful, but please don't feel you have to at all. The next activity, I, I would I will invite you again to, to share at the end of the next one, um, which is a little bit more fast paced and fun, perhaps. So you might feel a bit more ready or a bit more comfortable to share at that point. But I certainly don't, you know, this is your space and it's up to you. So unless anybody would like to hold up anything, you want to get another piece of paper or turn that one around. I mean, you, this, you, I imagine if you create, if you've covered this page, it is the, the right moment to have a fresh piece of paper. Obviously, I don't advocate never having a fresh piece of paper. So do, do grab what you have available. So just take a moment to just have that lovely blank space in front of us to look down. It's just a lovely thing to have a lovely fresh piece of paper and to just see it as something that's full of possibility. And we're going to think a little bit more about now about a sort of character in a poem and the world that, that character is in. And the poem I'm going to read is called Dog in the Playground and it's by Alan Alberg who I'm sure most of you have heard of, author of lots and lots of amazing children's books, Peep Home and Each Peach Pear Plum, um, and lots and lots of poems. And so for that reason, this one is quite good for younger children as well. It brings in a bit of energy. So I think there's, you know, the space for both. There's, it's nice to slow down, but it's sometimes nice to kind of change that speed slightly. So I, I will invite you to share at the end if you feel happy to. It'd be lovely to see your drawings and your responses to this. So I'm going to read it out and what I'd like you to think as I'm reading and, and to draw while I'm reading is who is the main character in this poem? I'd like you to draw this character as I read the poem and that you might want to draw it more than once because you, as you'll see the character, the main character of this poem does quite a lot and so it may be that you end up with a nice little series of different quick sketches and once again it doesn't have to be perfect, this is not about being creating good or perfect drawing. So, Dog in the Playground by Alan Albrecht, so you know I do. Dog in the playground, suddenly there, smile on his face, tail in the air. Dog in the playground, bit of a fuss. I know that dog lives next to us. Dog in the playground, oh no he don't, he'll come with me, you see if he won't. The word gets round, the crowd gets bigger. His name's Bob, it ain't, it's Tig Trigger. They call him Archie, they call him Frank. Lives by the fish shop, lives up the bank. Who told you that? Pipe down, shut up. I know that dog since he was a pup. Dog in the playground, we'll catch him, miss. Leave it to us, just watch this. Dog in the playground, what it to do? 35 children, caretaker too. Chasing the dog, chasing each other. I know that dog, he's our dog's brother. We've cornered him now, he can't get away. Told you we'd catch him, Robert, and hey, don't open that door. Oh, Glennis, you fool. Look, miss, what's happened? Dog in the school, dog in the classroom, dog in the hall, dog in the toilets, he's paying a call. 46 children, caretaker two, headmaster, three teachers, hullabaloo. Lost him, can't find him, he's vanished. And then, look miss, he's back in the playground again. Shouting and shoving, I'll give you what for. 65 children head for the door. Dog in the playground, smile on his face. Tail in the air, winning the race. Dog in his element, off at a jog, out of the gates, wish I was a dog. Dog in the playground, couldn't he run? Dog in the playground, gone. Okay, so hopefully, well, I mean, your main character may have been somebody else, but I imagine it's um, the dog. So you've all got your, hopefully the dog that you've imagined, that's your response down on the paper somehow. And you might have a little series of sketches there. Okay, so obviously this dog moved around a lot, the, the, um, the pace changed and the location changed a lot. So this dog was doing an awful lot of things. So it's a nice way to kind of respond to um, the rhythm of a poem and to draw to that rhythm as well. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is just think about where is your main, this main character, the dog, where is it in relation to the world of the poem? So. If you think quite literally, as younger children probably will, but again, thinking about the feeling of that world, thinking back to those warm ups and the, using the words like fragile and things like that. You know, that world, is it still? Is it busy? Is it loud? How might the activity of that playground be communicated 
through the marks that you make. So when you feel ready, just start adding in some responses to that of that world around the dogs that you've drawn. You may want to focus on just one of the dogs. You may want to create a sort of mini world around each of the drawings that you've done. So I'm going to allow you to just take a moment to, to build in that world around the dog and I'll read the poem again one time. Dog in the playground, suddenly there, smile in his face, tail in the air. Dog in the playground, bit of a fuss. I know that dog lives next to us. Dog in the playground, oh no, you don't. He'll come with me, you see if you won't. The word gets round, the crowd gets bigger. His name's Bob, it ain't, it's Trigger. They call him Archie, they call him Frank. This by the fish shop, lives up the bank. Who told you that? Pipe down, shut up. I know that dog since he was a pup. Dog in the playground, we'll catch him, miss. Leave it to us, just watch this. Dog in the playground, what are to do? 35 children, caretaker too. Chasing the dog, chasing each other. I know that dog, he's our dog's brother. We've cornered him now, he can't get away. Told you we'd catch him. Robert and, hey, don't open the door. Oh, Glenis, you fool. Look, miss, what's happened? Dog in the school. Dog in the classroom, dog in the hall. Dog in the toilets, he's paying a call. 46 children, caretaker too. Headmaster, three teachers, hullabaloo. Lost him, can't find him, he's vanished. And then, look, miss, he's back in the playground again. Shouting and shoving, I'll give you what for. 65 children head for the door. Dog in the playground, smile on his face. Tail in the air, winning the race. Dog in his element, off at a jog. Out of the gates, wish I was a dog. Dog in the playground, couldn't he run? Dog in the playground, gone. So I'll just give you a moment to finish off. Obviously, we're doing this as, as a, um, you know, one piece of paper and, and doing drawings around that one piece of paper. But a way that you can extend this or to, to explore this activity a bit further is to create a kind of storyboard for the action of the poem. And it's a great way to break down the understanding of of a piece of literature, whether it's, it could be a you know, story or a poem. And in fact, I think it's quite commonly done as well to sort of make it, I can't remember what they call them in the curriculum, but a sort of step outline really of a, of a story to check the understanding and the chronology. But when I say storyboard, I, what I mean by that is what I don't mean really is, is um, consigning each step of the poem to a perfect black square on the paper, um, but in, allowing the children to really express how that world changes and evolves creatively so yes you might have a kind of you might have a series of drawings that show a journey and you can kind of see the different points of that story but they're not necessarily the way that it's drawn the way that's laid out isn't too tightly held if that makes sense it's good to show that fluidity I think especially with a poem like that that is so active and so um, vibrant it's good to kind of transfer that onto the page. Quite fun for the kids as well. Also, I wanted to recommend a book, which some of you may have heard of, which is a real example of, it's not a storyboard, but it's the way that it's drawn so beautifully, communicates a story, and that's Det Detective Dog Nell by Julia Donaldson. I know you would have heard of Julia Donaldson, but it's not her usual illustrator. It's not Ax Axel Jeifner. It's a brilliant illustrator called Sarah Ogilvy, and I can certainly, I think, um, we'll be sent around some notes tomorrow, so I can add that in in case you forget. But um, I really recommend if you're doing, if you're using this poem in the class, that you can then um, you can sort of use that book to kind of really show how you can illustrate the story, the poem, beautifully drawn dogs, just captures movement in in such a brilliant way she's I'm a really big fan of her work when you're ready it would be wonderful when you're just finishing off your what you're doing if anybody has got any questions or any comments about that activity or would like to hold up their dogs <laughs> maybe you've given your dog a name maybe it's based on a dog that you know oh is that one I can see Charlotte wonderful yes <laughs> oh that's lovely yeah I can really see I love the I love how the drawings are just sort of over the page and they are they inter, interact with each other I think that's brilliant it gives some real movement to it Lucia oh wonderful yes and there's some great color there it's great to see the color and Kyle thank you wonderful you can really sense 
that dog moving around and creating its journey. Gemma, thank you, that's lovely. I'm just clicking for you, Glenn and Ed. Yeah, great. Oh yes, I can see, yeah. See some of the locations in there as well. Wonderful, running dogs. It's a great poem because you can really imagine, it's just so kind of in keeping with dog's behavior. You can just totally imagine the great time that dog has had. So it's quite a fun one, that one. Okay, wonderful. Does anybody have any questions at all about any of that? Anything they'd like to check in with? Did just if you were working, if you're working with children in, in a classroom, yeah. and you, you talk about kind of returning to things and practice, practice, how long would you spend on this? How long would you spend on the initial kind of who's the main character? Let's find the dog. How long would you then spend on building the world around the dog? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously we've done this as quite a, 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 a short, sharp sweet sort of activity. But I think in reality, all of these, maybe the warm ups less so because they are quite quick, but I think an hour certainly to, you know, have that start a discussion. But I think the key thing is to get, I think pencils to paper quickly is quite critical. I think as soon as you start unpicking something too much, but I mean, that's one method of doing it, obviously, but I think if you want to get a sort of instinctive, creative response on paper and for the children to really hone those um, those skills in drawing, then getting them to get st stuck in straight away is good. And then you can kind of take a step back, have those discussions and, you know, invite them to share their work and to, just, and to describe you know their drawing where their dog is who their dog is and what they've chosen to focus on um, and then you, and then those drawings that they've done can become part of a progression really towards you know a more final piece if that's what you want to do if you want them to we talk about quite a lot but certainly with my access art hat on is the advantages of having a working wall so obviously lots of schools have beautiful displays of artwork and that's lovely but it, it can sometimes tighten too much around what the outcome is and it's a really positive thing for the children to have up on the wall their their working process um, and they're, so that they're, they're seeing how they're thinking how they're drawing how they're solving problems creatively and responding individually and that they're able to converse with their peers about that as well so I think yeah does that answer the question sorry <laughs> yeah okay all right, so you can put your dogs away for the time being. Well, say goodbye to the dogs. You might want to pick them up at another, on another day. We're going to slow down a little bit again now. And we're going to look at another poem. So if you would like to get yourself comfortable with some more paper, um, I won't be asking you to share this one. So I don't want you to feel pressured in any way. This is just your response. We're going to, continuing the theme of Oranges, we mentioned oranges earlier in um, Lily Collins' poem. This is called The Orange by a poet called Wendy Cope. It's, it's quite a short poem, this one. So I just invite you to just listen carefully and I, you don't need to draw anything like that. If you would like to, that's absolutely fine. Just listen for now. At lunchtime, I bought a huge orange. The size of it made us all laugh. I peeled it and shared it with Robert and Dave. They got quarters and I had a half. And that orange, it made me so happy, as ordinary things often do. Just lately, the shopping, a walk in the park. This is peace and contentment. It's new. The rest of my day was quite easy. I did all the jobs on my list and enjoyed them and had some time over. I love you. I'm glad I exist. It's just quite a short feels like it just a sort of you can imagine that being a sort of thought at the end of the day just to get to get that down on paper and I thought that this poem was quite fitting given you know the times that we're all in at the moment and and how I think um I imagine for lots of school children school children there's been that return to school was perhaps overwhelming in lots of ways and this poem is quite a nice way to just pause and to reflect and to slow down 
So what I'd like you to do is just take a moment and we're not going to draw straight away, but I'd like you to just, you're welcome to close your eyes if you would like to, but don't feel you have to. I'd just like you to think for a moment about what ordinary things make you happy and try to think simply and small, just like in Wendy Cope's poem here. And there may well be more than one thing, but just try and rest on one of those things and just allow yourself to, to pause on that one thing for a moment. Maybe it's something, you know, walking the dog on a sunny morning or a time in the day where the busyness hasn't quite started. It could be something to do with the smell or the colours of the changing season which we're in now, the autumn coming. It could be reading a particular book. It could be anything you like. So just imagine that thing, that thing that makes you happy. And imagine that you're holding that thing in your hand and you're looking down at it and you're holding it safe in your fingers. And you just try and imagine what that, the weight of it would feel like in your hand. The presence of it on your skin, is it easy to hold? Can you hold it um, carefully? Does it fit in your hand, in the palm of your hand? Or does it keep slipping and sliding? And just imagine yourself working hard and carefully to keep that thing still, to hold it close, to not let it fall away or disappear. And then when you're ready, you can just pick up some drawing things. You can choose what you, what you would like to use, whichever you feel you enjoy using. And just whilst keeping that thought of holding that thing in our hand, just begin to respond to that thing through drawing, thinking about how you can communicate that thing on paper. How, does, how can you represent it? And thinking about how can you protect that happiness and trying to think about what lines or marks we can use to represent how we might protect it. So perhaps within a kind of bubble or encasing it somehow or creating or communicating a feeling of warmth somehow how would we how would we communicate warmth you know can we bring in some color thinking about shielding it and what do those marks look like we're thinking about shielding an object that we draw on the page and again you know are you drawing it as a, a sort of literal representation or are you thinking more about the feelings that are evoked by that thing that makes you feel happy or indeed is it a combination of the two it doesn't have to be completely distinct you can um, you can blend those two things together and in fact that's a lovely thing to experiment with to think okay what happens if if I'm drawing um, a fresh autumn morning how can I combine drawing that in a more literal sense perhaps leaves rushing across the page but also, how can I draw how that makes me feel or the speed of those leaves? How can we start blending those two things together, the, the literal and the more representative or abstract way of drawing? But just allow yourself to move across the paper and to try and keep your wrist quite relaxed. I think it's quite an important thing to remind children as well that to, you know, it's good to sort of vary the pressure, certainly in drawings, but we need to try and relax our whole bodies when we're drawing. You know, we want to, we want to kind of invest our bodies into it. And if we're holding them tightly, if we're holding our arms tightly, or we're crossing our legs too much, or whatever, if we're not comfortable in our seats, then it's harder to to allow that process to happen. So keep connecting with that thing that you've thought of that makes you happy, and but allow yourself to wonder as you draw. So it doesn't matter. If Maybe your drawing is becoming something else. Maybe as you've been drawing, you've thought about something else and you want to kind of connect those two things together because to you, that connection is important. So just allow your mind to wander through those thoughts and then just gently bring yourself back to that association of that feeling of happiness. So what we're doing here really is, I'm giving you as adults, obviously, you're, you know, we're, we're engaging with, um, a sort of practice of gratitude and thinking about things that make us feel happy but for children it's a it's a nice pause in the day to do this this can be a warm-up 
It can be an activity that it's quite good to do to settle or focus a class, that sort of bundle of energy that comes in after playtime or lunchtime. And having something like this to reset and to just kind of calm the mind is, is quite an important thing in the school day. I think it's quite a busy day. Some children find the business quite overwhelming and it's nice to punctuate it with some quieter moments as well. So obviously this for younger children, you know, this might be a little bit more challenging perhaps. But I think, I, I certainly think that that discussion at the beginning of what makes us feel happy is something that younger children will certainly be able to communicate um, in a way that this activity could be extended or you could adapt it is that you could actually bring some making into this as well so I find that things like using clay is such a lovely tactile material and you could you could absolutely transfer this over to a making activity as well or you could do both you could start with drawing and then maybe they render something using um, clay but that the connection with that material is absolutely central to it and the connection with what that feeling of happiness is so they are pausing and slowing down on that thing so important also um, to think about different papers and the types of effects that different papers can have and it's a funny thing that sometimes I find this personally as an artist but I sometimes find um, a big new sheet of very white cartridge paper somehow t makes me feel quite tense sometimes. Whereas something like sugar paper or newsprint, it just kind of, it by its very nature feels like you can kind of experiment a bit more or loosen up a bit. So just think about that when you're, if you're delivering things like this in the class and what kind of how you want them to feel, how, what experiences you want the children to have and how the paper can impact that, as well as, as, well as the materials themselves, obviously. Sorry, Jean, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, would you, would you give them a choice of different papers? So you might set out a, two or three different papers on a table and they might choose the one that they want to use? Yeah, I think choice is one of the most important things for any child's creative education really but that choice isn't necessarily known to them at the start so I think it's it's about building blocks and foundations of what those materials are so if they've had if if they've had a meaningful experience of different materials what those materials do and also what different papers are and what types of marks you can make on different papers if that is if they have that as their foundation then it enables them to make choices as they get older. So in theory, by the time they're in year six, they should absolutely know that if you are using watercolour, you need to use watercolour paper, but also within watercolour paper, there's different, there's different grades of um, absorbency and, and which one is best for which. Things like if you're using um, charcoal, that newsprint is particularly good. And to use with charcoal. So it's about building those experiences through um, guided drawing, through regular um, sketchbook practice. And so that when they do go on to do sort of more final, and I, when I say final, I don't mean, um, you know, a perfect, you know, perfect, perfect final piece, but a, a more perhaps an extended, perhaps is a better word to use, an extended piece of work, that they, they are able to make those choices because they know what those materials do. Because um, not every material is suitable for every type of drawing or painting. So, yeah, I definitely. But, you know, I, I'm also aware that resources and materials are, are a challenge. And that's, you know, that it can be hard to provide a range of materials all the time. So it's just, you know, as much as you can do within the limitations that you have, really. I don't know if any of you where you are have um, scrap stores, but they're quite good for um you know, you could sort of sign up and you can go and I, I you could pay a certain fee, but you can then go and gather bags and bags of basically scrap paper or materials to then have in your art cupboard. So um, it's, it might be something to look into in your local area. We've got one down here. So I'll just let, let you have a minute to finish off your drawing. Oh, Jim has written there's a scrap store in Middlesbrough. That's good. Yeah, I think this sort of central website directory sort of website that lists them. 
Okay. So I'll just let you finish off your lines. Or... Just a thought, sorry to yeah, interrupt, Rich. just a thought, fine. Charlotte, I'm just thinking that this is something we could maybe explore to put on the website in terms of information about whether there are scrap stores or, or similar places. I know there used to be the Children's Warehouse in Newcastle. I don't know if that still exists, where there were lots of materials that were available for schools to go and collect. But that might be something for us to look into. Yeah, absolutely. We can look into that. I, I definitely know the Middlesbrough one is open and, and kind of working, but I'm not sure about Newcastle, so I'll have right. a look at that and pop it on the website. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is one in Newcastle. Yeah, we have a lot of, um, lots of teachers we work with use Scrap Store. And, and also things like, I mean, ask, you know, just for um, families to bring in materials from home. It's not always easy, but for a particular project, obviously. And just sort of saving paper, <laughs> just kind of seeing... Uh, you know it doesn't have to be you know drawing paper it can be all sorts of you know you can draw on anything and um, and I think it, it's just about widening your widening the perspective perception of what what can be drawn on really if anybody would like to share and they're drawing then please feel free but you don't have to share I don't mean share your your word or your you don't have to say what your happiness was because it's personal to you but um, you're welcome to share so we're fit, oh, is it 11.30, Jean, it is, isn't it? A uh, question from Mel. How do you manage children who struggle to be open-minded and creative? Yes. Well, it's very common <laughs> for there to be a sort of tension or a preoccupation with making something that's perfect. And I don't really know, you know, it's not like you can't really wave a magic wand and just sort of, do one session and so suddenly everybody's going to feel really creative but I do think that it's just about regular habits and not necessarily feeling like you need to spend you know a long time on an art session or an art project and this really can be this can be 10-15 minutes every day where you're just engaging them with some, with some mindful drawing or some some type of response to an object or a stimulus in some way and you embed that in um, to the day and I think I think showing lots of artists work as well I think you know that's a really critical part of helping children to understand what what an artist is because an artist is so many different things and uh, broadening that understanding and uh, you know inspiring them with lots of different types of work I think um, quite often you know there's a, there's a topic happening and then maybe one artist might be looked at, say Monet, for example, and his the bridge over his garden, the pond in his garden, and that's lovely. Obviously, his work is lovely. I think, I think you know, if you can, if it's like two or three artists that you then look at, then you've got a whole extended discussion that can take place over the, the, the comparison between that artist's work, what children like about it, what differs about it, and then enabling them to sort of see that they can have a creative response that's different to their the person sitting next to them or their friends on the next table and um, because that's how in the real world how artists work so I think yeah just broadening their understanding as much as possible and that regular practice one thing I'm doing at the moment is um setting up some a sketchbook corner in each classroom in, in a school local to here where where they would have their normal reading books they, they also are going to have sketchbooks as well and a little pot of objects like shells or pebbles and then a little pot of drawing prompts and they can get their sketchbook choose an object choose a drawing prompt and just take five ten minutes to go and sit down and quietly respond to that object with the drawing prompt and it's just those little little things to embed in they don't necessarily have to take an awful lot of time i think it's what it's really tricky to develop the habit with um, such time constraints but I know what's worked for me slightly is um, actually me modelling terrible, well, I'm saying terrible drawn, but free drawn and letting them yeah. have a laugh and me laughing at my own work. Yeah. So that I'm encouraging kind of that safe environment. Yeah. So I'm not always modelling perfection. And then that's, that's yeah. them a little bit. That's absolutely critical. And in fact, I was going to sort of mention at the end that modelling is, is, is so, so important. And to... Uh, 
to allow the children to feel like you, you are also going on a creative journey and you are also discovering that material. And, you know, every teacher will have a, a varying level of um, experience or background in art and some will come from an art background, some won't at all. And it really, really doesn't matter if you don't. And it's about it's about discovering the subject alongside the children and then getting those peer discussions happening because that's how the I don't like to use the word assessment, but the assessment sort of in a way happens through those conversations because it's not a subject that could, can or should be, in my opinion, um, assessed in the same way as, as other subjects because it's just completely different. And um, I think those those conversations and, and paving the way for those types of conversations is really important. Find yourself some more paper again and your materials. Now, this poem, the reason I chose this one is... I think it's probably aimed at slightly older children. Some of the um, content is perhaps a little bit beyond the reach of younger ones. So that's partly why I left it to the end, to the end in case, because I wasn't sure whether it was going to be 100% right for all age groups. But um, the actual activity you could do with a different poem, obviously any of these you could do with a different poem. So if you are working with younger children and you think this is a bit old, then please, you know, you can choose whatever you like. And really, this one, I wanted to, I mean, I don't know what size paper you all have, but if you do have a bigger piece of paper than you've been working on, I would go, um, I mean, you know, you could go A1, A0 for this, but we're working a bit bigger, basically, want to work a bit bigger. And to show how, um, what can happen when we start really moving our body with a drawing. So I, before I say any more, I'm going to read the poem and I would just like you to think about the whole world of this poem and to think about the features in that landscape and try and stretch that landscape across your paper in whatever way you feel you want to draw it. OK, it's called Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for 100 miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. So I'll just allow you to carry on responding as you want to. And you'll notice that that poem tackles some quite some slightly deeper emotions, perhaps some concepts that are more familiar, perhaps to us as, as adults. But nevertheless, there's quite a, there's some quite clear imagery. Um, there's some emotive words. There's some lovely description. There's some identifiable objects. All things that younger children as well will be able to connect with and be familiar with. And so, I just invite you to just try and as you're drawing to relax as much as you can in your shoulders and in your arm and to just try to work a little bit bigger to use more gesture with your arm coming right from your shoulder just be conscious of that movement and that strength coming from your shoulder down your arm to your elbow and then further down the rest of your arm towards your wrist your hand and just try and really move the whole of your arm the whole of your body as you're drawing thinking about you know these wild geese and the movement that comes with thinking about wild geese and flying over a large landscape and that those lovely words announcing your place in the family of things it's just a lovely image a lovely thing to pause on um, so it, 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 I think this poem sort of, it conjures up a feeling of the scale of things, really. And so it, it works well to then make our drawing larger in response to that. 
And I would really recommend for this, if you're doing it in a classroom, that you um, provide an opportunity for the children to work physically in different positions. It's really valuable here. So things like putting paper up on the wall, just, you know, getting out from behind those desks and where possible, getting the paper on the floor, doesn't matter if it gets a bit grubby, doesn't matter if it gets a bit torn, you have the materials out, you know, sort of embrace the chaos of it, I guess. Allow the children to choose where they would like to work, whether it is on the wall or on the floor, or just in a different part of the room. I think it's it's a really good contrast to sometimes we do draw quite small and I, I draw quite small a lot of the time and every now and again I just feel like I really need to draw something really big to just kind of you know shake it off a bit and um, I think kids respond to that really well having that opportunity obviously this is talking about a landscape but that's not to say it can't be a portrait drawing that you do it's your own response you can focus on the moment in the poem or in the on the whole world of it as well. I mean, we're thinking about the whole world of it, but it could be that you want to focus on that a moment within the whole world and how you're showing that, how it's how it sits within that world, within that space. space. Okay, so I think we've got to go quite soon. Nearly time to finish, so we better just round up. Has anybody got any last questions they'd like to ask? Can I just ask a question of, of, of people, really? For those of you who've come with a kind of art and DT lead or we've got Glenn and Ed who kind of, you know, literacy and all things to English and, and art, can you see a, an application for some of these techniques that, that Rachel shared with us this morning, either with your staff or most definitely in your classrooms? Just interested to get some sort of general feedback from people. Yeah, I mean, we have a specific week where we really try to embrace more creativity when it comes to both English and arts. So we do something called Take One Book Week, which we, we try and make sure that everyone's a lot freer in terms of their approach and give them a lot more freedom to just come totally off timetable. And I can see this having a really nice application for that, where we're able to, the whole school shares that one book. And then the amount of different artwork that, you know, you can really let the children take a lead and, and take it in the direction that they want. And it's amazing when you see the different year groups, how they really have coming up from different different tangents and angles. And it can make for a, a really interesting and uh, creative project, I think. Sounds great. Sounds great. And I think one of the things that interested me, Rachel, was your, your comment about this, the, the repetition and the practice. So I think that whole thing about repetition and practice in terms of mark making and using different materials, <clears throat> using different papers, then gives them more greater skills and, and and kind of choices in in terms of how they approach that so if you do you were to do a take one book week and you gave different year groups or you know you you, you gave everybody a range of materials and papers the the kind of the wealth of what you would get back is is mm -hmm. amazing really if you're an art lead in the class uh, in your school would you would you see yourselves perhaps doing something like this with your staff for a a staff training session thumbs up yes no <laughs> great I think it's the challenge isn't it the art leaders often I, I think as far as I understand it it used to be more common for practitioners to come in and do in, in set for art leads or the teachers but I think it's now down to the art lead to train well not train but to sort of do the overview of the the art curriculum to the other teachers and in fact sometimes that's a real challenge you know yeah so Carly's had to leave spot on 11 unfortunately but she said thank you for a wonderful session what a wonderful way to spend the morning really enjoyed it and will take the experience into the rest of my day uh, unfortunately she said thank you for an excellent session and Lucia said Lovely. the same thank you thank you that's great I mean I'm I'm very happy to if anybody's got any questions I, I don't know if they can go through you Charlotte or whatever but I'm you know if anyone's got anything they want to follow up with me over that's absolutely fine yeah. Um, and we do we do plan to send out a, a little resource pack from this session that Rachel's collated, which includes the poems that she used today and yeah. and the, a little bit more, just a little reminder of, of her approach and techniques and how you might apply them. So as Culture Bridge will probably will be sending out an evaluation form for the session, we'll get that resource pack that Rachel's put together out to you as well. 
So thank you very much, Rachel. I think that's been a really interesting session. I do feel quite calm now. I do feel quite <laughs> calm and very relaxed, I have to say. Oh, good. Really enjoyable. And thank you all for your time this morning. I hope you found it useful. And keep in touch with Culture Bridge and things that are, are going to be happening. This is the second of two art and design sessions that we've had online. And next term, we're looking at early years practice. So if you've got any early years practitioners in your school, we'll be running some online sessions for early years. And also to mention the Imagine If conference that's coming up in November, which has a, a wide range of online workshops that you can you can book for I think booking's open now isn't it Charlotte yeah it's open now it's for both the education and the cultural sector and our theme is being brave uh, when you're creative so creative bravery is the theme and the sessions on three sessions a day for about a week and you can dip in and out with them they're all on zoom and they're all free as well so they're on our website for booking and if you're not on the culture bridge mailing list and you you don't yet get their school's newsletter go onto the Culture Bridge website and sign up for it because there's a lot of information that comes out in that about forthcoming events and training and all sorts of things. And more Creative Classrooms news will come through that. So it's a really good way to keep in touch and have that coming directly to your inbox so that you're in, you know, up to speed with opportunities. So great. Thanks ever so much. Thank you ever so much, Rachel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for your time this morning and enjoy the rest of your day.